Hello and welcome to Jason Live. We're back once again with our STEM career series where we connect you with role models in science, technology, engineering, and math and learn about their careers. Today's STEM model, role model is Lisa Jones. Lisa is a research fisheries biologist with NOAA's National Marine Fisheries Service. She's also been a Jason host researcher in our terminal velocity curriculum. Lisa studies shark populations in the Atlantic Ocean and the Gulf of Mexico. She spends her time in her office, in her lab, and at sea doing a wide range of activities that help us better understand the life history of sharks, including some deep water species that are relatively unstudied. We're going to learn all about Lisa's work and career path in just a moment, but before we do, I remind everybody out there that today's event is live and interactive. We'll be taking your questions and uh, asking you to participate in our polls. To do both of those, you can use the box that's just below the video window and this webpage. We hope to get as many of you involved as today in today's program as we can. Right now, it's time to get Lisa involved. Thanks for joining us, Lisa. It's great to have you. It's great to be here. Good afternoon. All right. So we're going to start off the program talking about your current job, the, the work that you do, the research that you do on sharks. And uh, I know we've gotten a lot of questions already from students who are curious about that work and, and curious about sharks in general. So we're going to jump into that in just a moment. But, but um, why don't you kind of give us an overview uh, and, and give us a little more detail about the kind of work that you do as a shark biologist? Okay. Um, a big part of what we do is try to track the population status of sharks. We do an annual survey in Gulf of Mexico and in the Atlantic from Florida up to North Carolina so that we can study trends. We can get absolute population numbers that are given the basis over time study trends in the population. We've got it. And yeah. uh, having a little trouble with your audio today, um, but hopefully that will resolve itself and everybody will be able to hear what you're saying. Um, we're going to kick off the questions from our audience with the video question. And I know that uh, Lisa is having trouble hearing our video questions today, so I'm going to repeat those. But uh, this first one comes from Jenna and Jolie. Big question in your current project, and what kind of data are you look collecting in your research right now? So they want to know what's the big question in your research right now, and uh, how you go about collecting data for it. The biggest question in our research right now is how healthy are the populations of different species? And to do that, as I said, we do surveys over time. We've been doing surveys for 17 years now, and we can tell by trends and the numbers that we catch from year to year, how the population is doing. Got it. We're going to go to another video question right now. This next one is from Lauren and Miriam. Dr. Jones, what equipment do you use to get the data for your project? And how do you use the data that you collect in your project? All right, their question was, what equipment do you use in your research to get the data, and how do you use that data? Okay, we use everything from, um, it's called a long line. It's a set of fishing gear that has 100 hooks on it. We use everything from very simple things like that to catch them to advanced, more advanced techniques, such as um, satellite tagging to track their movements. We collect all the data, obviously, in our computer, and then we can do our, our time series analysis that way. All right, we're going to jump to some of our text questions. This first one is from Jane. She's asking, uh, or she says, we researched that sharks have been around for millions of years, even before the dinosaurs. What unique adaptations do they have that have helped keep them around for so long? Great. Sharks have some um, amazing adaptations. They're very, very well suited as, as predators in the marine environment. They have um, senses that help them find prey, sight, smell, which because it's in an aquatic environment, it's actually taste. They can sense movement in the water with their lateral line system. They can also detect electrical currents in the water. Um, they grow to a relatively large size, many of them. 
so they don't have very many predators themselves. Um, their life history is very well suited to their environment, except for the fact that because they grow slowly, mature late, they don't handle fishing pressure, in other words, human pressure. Um, so although they've been around for a long time, there are some species that we're very concerned about because of that. We're going to jump to a text question from Caden here. He says uh, he's in the sixth grade. He's studying the effect of acid and vinegar on sharks' teeth for his science fair project, and he wants to know if sharks will survive in the increasing acidity levels in oceans. He, he also has a follow-up question here. Do you think sharks' teeth will change over time and become softer with that increased acidity? Over time, I don't know. It would depend on the increase in the acidity. We do know that um, organisms that um, have calcium carbonate shells have a harder time depositing those shells as the acidity increases. I suppose it's possible that it could be harder for the sharks to um, calcify their teeth over time. I think the acidity levels would have to increase pretty significantly for that to be a problem. We've got a question from Crystal. Uh, she wants to know, what's the, what kind of shark is the hardest to track down for you in your studies, and, and what kind of shark do you most hope to see when you're out at sea? There are a lot of sharks that we don't see frequently. They're just not that abundant. One of those is the dusky shark, which is one of the main sharks that people are concerned about seeing overfished. We get pretty excited when we see one of those. Also, most of our studies are in coastal waters, so there's some oceanic species that we don't see very often, like mako sharks and um, pressure sharks. Um, some scientists here have also done some work with whale sharks, and they can be a little tough to track down. Generally, they have to have spotter planes to find them. Whenever we talk about sharks, um, you know, folks are always interested because it's, it can be kind of a scary animal. But Mara wants to know, does any type of shark scare you, or, or do you just like sharks altogether? Well, it would depend on the situation. Um, any shark can be a little bit scary, even if they don't have the crazy large teeth. Their skin's very rough and can get injured. But overall, I think they're absolutely fascinating creatures. We've got a, a kind of fun question here, I think, from Trey next. He says, do sharks have more facial muscles than humans, considering they don't smile, but they eat big animals? It's entirely different structure. Um, some people say sharks do grin, but uh, I, I, don't th I don't see it as a grin. I don't know exactly how many facial muscles sharks have, but they don't show a lot of facial expression. Uh, another kind of related question. This is a video question next from Serena. How are sharks similar and how are they different to humans? Serena wants to know, how are sharks similar and how are they different from humans? Well, th there are a lot of similarities. I mean, sharks have a lot of the same relatively the same body structures. They have vertebrae, they have eyes, they have teeth, they have tongues, but um, sharks, and in fact all elasmobranchs, which are sharks, gates, rays, and chimeras, have skeletons that are made of cartilage. Um, humans are also what are considered warm bloody. And while there are some species of sharks, particularly some of the oceanic fast swimming sharks, that can regulate their body temperature somewhat, um, most sharks cannot. Okay, we're going back to the text questions now. This one's from Jane. She says, at school, we study biomes of the world and how to protect them. We also learn a lot about the animal and plant species found in those biomes. Is there one particular ocean that seems to have more sharks than others, and if so, why? That would be the Pacific Ocean, and just because of the size, it's so much larger, there are so many more options for habitats. Okay, we've got a uh, question from Ricky and Kevin next. They want to know, how do you find out what kind of shark it is when some look so f similar? That's a great question, and that's actually something I've been looking at in my research. 
some of them do look very similar, so similar that you can't tell them apart from external morphology. We call those cryptic species. There are other species of sharks that although they look fairly similar, there are a few ways to tell them apart. Um, sharks have um, what are called dermal denticles instead of scales. These are basically microscopic teeth that are embedded in their skin. And for some species, they have different shapes, and you can tell them apart that way. Uh, some have different numbers of vertebrae, uh, different shapes of teeth, different numbers of cusps on their teeth. Sometimes these are pretty subtle differences, and you have to look at a lot of sharks and, and really pay attention to, to make sure you've got the right species. All right, our next question now is from Madison. She wants to know, uh, I'm sorry, this is from Saxon. Uh, since you do research on deep, she's deep sea sharks, how do you capture or conduct uh, this research on the sharks that might thrive in the Mariana Trench, like way at the bottom of the ocean? Well, for that deep sea, we at our lab don't have that kind of technology. That you'd have to use uh, either submarine or an ROV to study them. It's is very, very tough to capture, actually catch them in that depth, and you certainly wouldn't get into the surface alive. When I say deep water sharks, uh, what we're looking at is species that live here in the Gulf of Mexico and the western, northern, northwestern Atlantic that live on the shelf, not necessarily on the abyssal plain or in the trenches. Kevin has a uh, related question. He wants to know what's the deepest you have been personally while out at sea? Do you do any diving to, to conduct your research? Uh, we, I, I don't do diving for my research. Basically, we catch them and handle them. Uh, so the deepest I've been is probably 30, 35 feet in the free dive. Okay, we've got a question from Kara next. When you're out at sea, what do you do when you're analyzing data? When we're out at sea, it's more the data collection phase of it. Um, we catch the sharks if they're small, we bring them on board, we measure them, we weigh them, we make sure we have the right species, we take photographs, we may take a little piece of a fin, what we call a fin clip for genetic studies, uh, then we tag them and let them go. Um, we put different types of tags on them, they're what are called archival tags that just stay on the chart. You can see examples in the photo. And we also use satellite tags on some of them. That's a more active way to track them. Um, so basically, we're at sea, we're collecting data. Uh, the, the analysis happens when we get back to the lab. Makes sense. Riley's question is next. She wants to know, what's the most interesting part of your day at work? Uh, that's a tough question. Um, it depends on where I'm working. Um, at sea, obviously, it's every time we put deer in the water, we don't know what we're going to catch. So there's always something to look forward to. Here in the lab, I really enjoy um, basically doing what you would call dissections and doing the life history workup, working in the lab. All right, we're going to jump back over to our next video question. And this one is from Jack. What's your greatest discovery while being a shark biologist? So Jack asks, what's your greatest discovery as a shark biologist? Oh, wow. Um, I don't know. Actually, I hope I haven't made it yet. <laughs> I hope there's uh, something really wonderful out there that I'll find. We've got a live question that just came in from Mrs. Boland's third and fourth grade class. They want to know, are sharks aware that their fins are showing when they're in shallow water? And does this help them hunt? Well, well I really can't tell you what a shark might or might not be thinking. My, my guess is no. I don't think they're particularly aware of uh, where their fins are out of the water with, when they're at the surface. Makes sense. Jake uh, has another hunting-related question. Uh, he says, I've heard that blue sharks hunt in packs together. Do any other shark species hunt in groups? Well, while you might um, consider it a pack, we would call it a school. But yes, there are other sharks that do group for different reasons. I've seen silky sharks um, going after um, prey in groups. Um, a lot of times you'll see around sea mounts and, and other places you see groups of hammerheads. Some groups, some sharks group together to migrate or during breeding season. You just mentioned the hammerhead. Our next question is uh, 
about the hammerhead. Kyle wants to know how hard is the bone or cartilage that goes across the hammerhead's head? Um, it, it's definitely harder than the cartilage, say, in your ear or your nose. It is definitely cartilage, and it is somewhat flexible, but it's also different parts of the shark skeleton are calcified to a different degree. For example, the vertebrae and the teeth are very hard, whereas the fins are, are much more flexible. And in a hammerhead's head, it's fairly rigid. Madison wants to know if you've ever seen a great white in person. And if you have, what, did that, what was that experience like? Unfortunately, I have not seen a great white in person. I would, I would love to. Um, I have seen them from the air when I was flying aerial surveys in the West Coast. And um, I think it would be really exciting. I know it's, it's always exciting here when we catch something like a, a large tiger shark or a, a big six-scale shark. Great white. It's obviously a, a very large type of shark. Connor's got a question uh, about small sharks. Let's see what he has to say. What is the smallest shark you've ever seen? Connor wants to know, what's the smallest shark you've ever seen? The smallest shark I've ever seen are a group of deep water sharks that we, we do catch here in the Gulf, and they occur other places in the world as well. And it's a genus that's called Etmopterus, and they can actually, some of the smaller ones are just about the size of, of my pinky. Wow. I wish I had an image of that. But we don't, so uh, we're, like, <laughs> we're going to keep on moving on. Um, we're going to switch gears a little bit. We've talked a lot about uh, your current research, your current career, and, and obviously lots of uh, details about sharks. But uh, one of the things we like to do here at Jason Live is learn about your, the path that you took to pursue your STEM career. So we're going to jump into some questions now related to that. Uh, actually, I think our first one here is going to be a video question. Let me load that up. Uh, this one's from Alex. Biography. You didn't seem interested in biology until high school. What caused you to pursue this career, and when did it happen? So Alex just asked, uh, in your biography, you didn't seem to be interested in biology until high school. Uh, what sparked your interest? Actually, I was always, always into biology. I was always interested in animals. I grew up with... Uh, dogs, cats, horses, cows, um, and at one time I actually thought I wanted to be a veterinarian. And I started out as a biology major in college um, and got really interested in geology and I actually got my undergraduate degree in geology. My favorite part of geology is paleontology or studying fossils. So I've always been interested in biology. So our, uh, our next text question here is from Stacia. Why are you specifically interested in sharks now, at least, uh, opposed to other ocean animals? Why, why choose to focus? I just think they're absolutely fascinating, and there's so much that we don't know. There are a lot of species that are really well studied, um, but there's, we're even finding that we don't know how many species of sharks there are. We're finding that there are what I described before as a cryptic species that look just like another one, and there are so many areas of the ocean that just haven't really been explored well enough that we find new species all the time. We learn uh, new life history adaptations all the time. It's, it's the the amount that that we still don't know that keeps me interested. Uh, Ricky and Kevin have our next question. Uh, they want to know, did the location that you lived in or, or grew up in inspire you to uh, pursue this line of work? I don't know what you want to know which location I lived in. I, I grew up inland in, in the mountains actually in east tennessee um but i always loved the ocean my folks always took us to the beach every summer and um i couldn't stay out of the water there you go we're gonna keep things moving here and jump to our poll questions next uh, we've asked lisa lots of questions and now it's her turn to ask you some questions. She came up with these poll questions, and here's the first one. True or false, sharks, skates, rays, and chimeras, elasmobranchs, are fish. Is that true or false? So we're going to push the poll right now So to, to give our audience an opportunity to vote on this and let us know if they think it's true or false. Um, 
while we're giving them a second to, to vote here, Lisa, why don't you, uh, there, there are a couple words that I clearly am struggling with here, chimeras okay, and elasmobranchs. Why don't you tell us what those are that might okay. influence their vote? Okay, chimeras are, um, they also, the common name form is ratfish. They live in deep water. They're related um, to the other elasmobranchs, but there are some differences. Okay, we've got some we've got responses coming in now. So far, about sixty percent think that the answer is true, and about forty percent think false. Why don't we go ahead and give them the correct answer, Lisa? The sixty percent are correct. Um, they are all actually fish. Uh, a lot of people think that when people think of fish, they think of things more like snap or a group or maybe flounder or trout. Sure. The difference is that all those fish have bony skeletons and the elasmobranchs have skeletons made of cartilage. Got it. We're going to move on to poll question number two. This is also a true or false. We know almost all there is to know about sharks. Is that true or is that false? Well, we're going to push the poll now, start to get some responses. So, Lisa, I... I kind of um, doing a lot of stuff on the back end here. Not sure if we have covered this a as an answer to one of the questions. I think I might have given a hint in the intro. So I'm not sure if we're going to fool too, too many people on this one. Let's see. So far, we've got 3% uh, think true and 98%. Actually, it's moving. So 2% true, 98% think false. Uh, I have a feeling that as more results come in, th that's going to stay pretty much heavily weighted towards the false end of things. So why don't you go ahead and give us the correct answer. Is that true or false? It's absolutely false, and I, I think I explained that that's one of the reasons I love studying these guys so much. There you go. Let's move on to poll question number three. This is not a true or false, but um, kind of our, our standard... A, B, or C mix. Um, this one says, is it important to understand the life history of an organism? Uh, answer A, no, it is not important at all. Answer B, yes, it is important because it is interesting. Or I'd say because uh, it helps us satisfy our scientific curiosity about these organisms. Or is the answer C, yes, it is important because you need this understanding to properly manage a species? A, B, or C, is it not important? Or is it important? And what's the best answer out of B or C for why it is important? We've got answers coming in already, Lisa. So far, 96% are voting for C. We've got a couple votes for A. Nobody thinks it's B. And we'll give this just a few more seconds. Folks uh, have a chance to respond. And I want to remind everybody out there, if you have maximized the video player window, you're going to need to shrink that back down in order to participate in the polls. All right, so our, our results are settling in. About 90% think it's C. And a smattering of just a few votes for A and B. Lisa, why don't you give us the correct answer here? Well, while I do find it very interesting, the correct answer is C. Because I work for the National Fishery Service and we're part of the federal government. We are taxed with um, not only looking at population numbers, but understanding the life history. Because you can't manage or protect a species unless you understand um, Things like um, how old does it get? How old is it when it's mature? When it reproduces? How many pups does it have? Uh, all those things are critical to know before we can make accurate management decisions and hope that these uh, that the wonderful creatures stay in our oceans forever. Makes sense. All right, we're gonna continue on here, and we have a few questions that have come in that uh, relate to your your personal life, life outside of work. Uh, our first one is a video question from Abby. Let's listen to that now. In your biography, I read that you had a horse when you were a kid. I have a horse, too. I was wondering if you did any showing or if you were just riding for pleasure. 
Okay, so Abby's question was that she had seen in your biography that you had a horse as a kid. Uh, she also has a horse, and she's wondering if you showed your horse or did you just ride it for pleasure? I did both. Um, I showed um, American Saddlebred horses, and I, for a while, I even trained horses, especially um, American Saddlebred and Morgan. All right, we've got another personal question that just came in from Emily in Pennsylvania. What was your favorite stuff to do as a kid? Oh, Emily, I was always outside, pretty much anything outdoors, whether it was the horses or playing with the dogs or um, going camping in the woods. As long as I was outside, I was happy. Trey is curious about what areas of the world have you traveled to, I guess, either for work-related uh, travel or, or personal? I've been over a large portion of the United States. I've been to Mexico, Panama, Ecuador, um, Europe, and um, uh, a short trip in Africa. Pretty cool. And, and were those all work-related? Actually, the majority of those, no, were not work-related. Got it. They were personal. Andre... Uh, is curious about if you would encourage young kids to pursue your career, and if so, why? I would encourage um, young kids that have a very passionate interest in this to pursue it, absolutely. It's very rewarding. I've done other things in my life, and I'm glad that I settled on this career. Um, but I do want to tell everyone that's interested in it that it's, it's it's tough because there are fewer jobs than there are people that want to do it. You have to be absolutely committed to this. You've got to not only take the courses that you normally think, the science, the math, the computer, you've also got to be decent in, in courses like English and in writing because you have to be able to communicate what you find. You can learn the greatest thing in the world and if you can't communicate it to other people, it doesn't do anyone any good. So. For those kids that uh, that you have inspired today to potentially pursue uh, your type of career, uh, Kayla wants to know what school subjects would you recommend for a student who wants to pursue becoming a shark biologist? Okay, obviously, like I said, you definitely need uh, biology. Um, you need chemistry, physics, because we're going more from uh, studying single species to, to a habitat-based um, approach. Um, you need math, you need statistics, you need computer skills. As I said, English is, is really important, more important than you would think. And aside from just studying and working, um, I, I recommend that people get out and volunteer, whether it's at your local aquarium, uh, if there are any research institutes in you that, that, that have volunteer programs, even if it's just at a, say a state park or a beach. Uh, get out and volunteer. And the other thing I want to people to remember is that while your career is critically important and you have to be committed to it, you also need to have a life outside of that. So also keep up with your outside interests. I noticed in your uh, questionnaire that you had mentioned that you um, work with dogs or you, you, that's one of the things that you enjoy doing outside of work. Can you tell us a little bit about that? I can. I started um, about six years ago. I rescued an Australian Shepherd after Hurricane Katrina, and a friend of mine suggested that I might want to take an agility class. I don't know how many people have seen agility. It's where the dogs go over jumps and through the weed poles and through tunnels. So I took a class, and then I got hooked, and I just absolutely adore it. It's, it's, it's fun. The dogs have fun. I've met great people, and like I said, it, it, it gives me a break from always thinking about work. It looks like a lot of fun. I've seen it on TV, and it lo it's amazing yeah. to see what the dogs are capable in that kind of a scenario. And it, it just mm -hmm. looks like everybody is having a blast. Um, it is. Very cool. We're going to get back to time for just a few more shark-related questions for you. So we're going to jump into a question from Caden. He wants to know, is the great white a version or descendant of the megalodon? It is definitely related. I wouldn't call it a version. Um, it is a more recent relative of the megalodon. Okay. Christian asks, why are sharks attracted to blood? And we, we had some other questions that came in that we didn't get to that were related to uh, how are sharks able to sense that in the water from so far away? 
Okay. Well, sharks, as I said, they have amazing sensory systems. Um, one reason they're attracted to blood is sometimes if the water, if it's dark and there's no light, or if the water's really murky, they can't see their prey. So they have other senses to help them find it. And they have what are called nostrils. They're not like ours. What it really is, because they live in water, it's really more like taste, so they can taste the blood. And as I said, they can collect, detect electrical currents. Everything that's alive that goes into salt water gives off a small but detectable electrical current. They can feel vibrations that move through the water from a wounded fish. And like I said, because they live in this environment where they can't always use their eyes, they have to have other ways to find their food. Makes sense. We had a lot of questions that came in that were concerned about the well-being of sharks and the human impact on their population. Uh, Courtney's question here is related to that. They, she wants to know, are, are there economic consequences of not having sharks in, in the ecosystem? It, it definitely. I, what Exactly what those consequences would be, but anytime you drop disrupts or remove any level of an ecosystem, it affects everything else in that ecosystem. And that can be can be particularly um, a problem when you take out a top predator. All right. Um, we've asked you a lot of questions today, Lisa. We really appreciate you taking the time to answer them all. Uh, it's been fascinating to learn about your work and your career and, and the path that you took to get there. Really appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. All right, thank you. I enjoyed it. Great questions. All right. Um, coming up next week, we're actually going to be joined by yet another Jason alumni who works with critters with sharp teeth. Our guest will be former Jason Argonaut Paul Ginak, who is now a crocodile and dinosaur paleontologist. Paul studies modern-day animals, as we see here in this photo, measuring the bite force of an alligator. Um, they help him understand the creatures that he discovers in fossil digs. He uses advanced 3D imaging to reconstruct and manipulate vertebrate anatomy and also teaches first-year medical students human gross anatomy using cadavers. Uh, if any of that sounds interesting to you, don't miss our live STEM role model event with Paul Ginak next Thursday, March 6th at 1.30 p.m. Eastern. That is all for today. Thanks for joining us. Once again, for Jason Learning, my name is Patrick Shea. We'll see you next time on Jason Live. <laughs>